So, I gave you definitions, atomic number and mass number. And then we talked about the number of neutrons in an element. So let's just take the element carbon. We know how many protons carbon's got, right? We know how many electrons carbon has. And using the atomic mass or the mass number, we can figure out how many neutrons carbon has. But do you remember the number of neutrons wasn't a whole number, was it? It was 12 point something. And so, what is that little beep? Oh, all right. I thought it sounded like it's coming from the speakers. Um, but the number of neutrons in an element can vary. And when the number of neutrons varies in an element, we call those different atoms isotopes. And I'll illustrate that with an example. So let's look at sodium. It's got a mass number of 23 and an atomic number of 11. So how many neutrons does that atom of sodium have? 12? 12 plus 11 is 23, all right? So it's got how many protons? 11. How many neutrons? 12. So let's have a look at carbon. Carbon, then, we can have carbon, atomic number 6, atomic mass of 12. This particular atom, or these atoms of carbon, carbon always has an atomic number of 6. But the mass number for carbon atoms can vary a little bit. You've got carbon 12, you've got carbon 13, and you've got carbon 14. They're all carbon, and they're all atoms of carbon. They've all got the same number of protons, six. All got the same number of electrons, six. How many neutrons in this atom of carbon? Six. So carbon-12 has six neutrons. How many neutrons in this atom of carbon? How many atoms, uh, neutrons in this atom of carbon? Eight. OK. Now, carbon, and think about your diamond ring. All right, how many got diamonds on? Diamond is a pure form of carbon. Don't worry about the inclusions, because there are sort of impurities in it. But that diamond is made of carbon atoms, and only carbon atoms. And most of those carbon atoms happen to be carbon-12. They happen to be carbon atoms with six neutrons. A much smaller proportion happen to be carbon-13, carbon atoms with seven neutrons. And a tiny fraction of them happen to be carbon-14 that have eight neutrons. So your diamond ring is made up of carbon atoms, but there are different isotopes of carbon. Okay? And the different isotopes have different numbers of neutrons. Oh, I might have put this out of order. Hang on, hold your horses. Yeah, I did. I'm going to... Sorry, guys, I got this out of order. So, elements then are made of atoms, all have the same atomic number, but they're usually a mix of the different isotopes. Okay? Usually a mix of the different isotopes. And we'll use carbon as our example. Now, these different isotopes behave chemically in the same way. Carbon-12 reacts no differently to carbon-13, and it chemically reacts no differently than carbon-14. <coughs> but here's the deal with carbon. These isotopes are stable. Because carbon-12 will be carbon-12, and it won't change. Carbon-13 will be carbon-13, and it won't change. But carbon-14 is unstable. And it undergoes radioactive decay. 
and I'll not, I'm not going to go into that too much. I'll just sort of like gloss the surface. I'll give you enough um, to, to let you understand it. And, I'm, and I've got a question for you. So it's unstable. And it's radioactive. In fact, carbon-14 actually, by radioactive decay, changes into something else. It changes into nitrogen-14. Isn't that the weirdest thing you've ever heard? Changes into a different element. Ah, you don't know. Just by looking at it, you don't know and can't predict. But the research we've done shows that this is stable, this is stable, and we found out that this is unstable. But just by looking at it, you don't know that it would be stable or unstable. Does that make sense? You can't tell just by usually the higher number of neutrons. That's an indicator that that might be an unstable isotope. What's the atomic number for nitrogen? Anybody remember that one? Seven, it is, good. Carbon-14 radioactively decays and turns into nitrogen-14. So those of you that have your diamond rings, right? Look at your diamond rings, how precious that is, yeah? There are atoms of carbon-14 that unpredictably are breaking down and turn into nitrogen-14, which is a colorless, odorless gas. I don't know if those atoms can escape from your ring. If it's in the center, it probably can't. But how do you feel about that? Hey, this is a one carat ring. By the time I was 60, it's going to be smaller, right? Well, thankfully, the number of carbon-14 atoms is extremely low. So it's not going to affect you, you know, your ring. Okay? So don't worry about that. Now, here's a question for you then, a challenging question for you. How can we turn carbon-14 into nitrogen-14? I'm just going to pose the question for, to you. Hang on, don't, don't worry about the answer now. But if you want to go away from class, here's what I suggest you do. Try and figure it out. Try and figure it out. What would it take to change this into this? That's the question. What would it take to change this into this. What I'd like you to do is try and figure it out. Don't look up the answer. Next class, I'll show you how that happens, OK? But it's, a, it's an intriguing problem. It's an interesting problem. Question? Carbon-14 will turn into nitrogen-14 because of radioactive decay. So what would it take for it to do this? Because look. The atomic numbers are different, so there's different numbers of protons, right? Just play with the math. I'll give you a clue. Just look at these numbers and figure out what these numbers mean, and then just play with the math. What does it take for this to happen? What does it lose or gain in order to go into this? All right? Sorry? I'll say no more, but I'll tell you next time. OK? So it's just a little brain teaser, intriguing problem. It's just a little math problem, really. OK. So I said that an element is composed of the different isotopes, usually a different mixture of the isotopes. And for carbon, here's the way it goes. Nine, nearly 99% of your carbon atoms in your diamond ring are carbon-12. Just over 1% of carbon-13, both stable. And carbon-14 is present in very, very low amounts. What is that? How many zeros we got there? 0.00000000001. percent All right? It's a very tiny proportion of your carbon atoms are carbon-14. OK? And it just depends on the element as to what proportion the isotopes are present. Okay. Okay. Everybody good with isotopes? All 
All right. So now I want to talk about energy levels. Energy levels of electrons. And we've looked at the structure of the atom, and we've seen that the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and electrons have orbitals that fly around the nucleus. Okay? Um, well, there's an arrangement. There's a particular way that the electrons are arranged. And they arrange themselves in orbitals. And each orbital is a certain distance from the nucleus. And each orbital can only contain a certain number of electrons. And I'll tell you what those rules are. So there are rules for how many electrons each orbital can contain. So I'll use carbon again as my example. There's the nucleus of carbon. It's got six protons. And I'm just going to use carbon-12, so we'll say it's got six neutrons. It's also got six electrons. The first orbital, the closest one to the nucleus, contains two electrons. It's full at two electrons. So that's our first rule. First orbital is full at two. It can only contain two electrons. Carbon's got six, so there's another four electrons that have got to go somewhere, right? Well, they go into the second orbital. The filling rule for the second orbital... Oh, did anyone notice that spelling mistake? Did anyone notice that spelling mistake? No. The second orbital is full at eight electrons. Full at eight electrons. So those other four can go in this second orbital. Okay? So that's how we would arrange the electrons in a carbon atom. First orbital gets two, now it's full. So the remainder have to go into orbital number two. In the case of carbon, there's only four electrons. Orbital number two is full of eight. So how many more electrons could orbital number two accommodate until it's full? Four. D does that sort of jive with anything else you know about carbon? It needs four more electrons to fill its outer shell. What else do you know about carbon that, I don't know? Yeah, carbon could create four bonds, can't it? That's how many bonds, chemical bonds, carbon forms. Is that just coincidence? It can form four bonds, and it also needs four electrons, four more electrons to fill its outer shell. Well, let's have a look at this a bit more closely then. How would you draw um, an atom of hydrogen? Draw an atom of hydrogen. Draw the nucleus and the electron configuration for hydrogen. You know hydrogen's got an atomic number of one, right? So draw hydrogen. Atomic number of one. Don't worry about the neutrons. Hydrogen in its nucleus has how many protons? One. And how many electrons does hydrogen have? One. One electron goes in that first orbital. How many more electrons does hydrogen need to fill its outer shell? One. How many bonds does hydrogen form? All right. Looking quite suspicious now, isn't it? Um, oxygen. How many bonds does oxygen form? 
Do you remember how many bonds oxygen forms? Two. Oxygen forms two bonds. And you know that simply because you know the stick diagrams that I've drawn, that we've drawn? Oxygen always has two bonds coming from it, right? And the atomic number for oxygen is what? Eight. eight. Is it eight? Yeah. yeah, it's eight. All right, so let's draw oxygen. There's the nucleus. How many protons in the nucleus? So let's arrange its electrons. We've got eight electrons we've got to deal with. There's that first shell, full at two. So how many have we got left over? Six. We've got to put those six electrons in the second shell. Can the she second shell accommodate all six electrons? Yeah. All right, so one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, six. How many more electrons does oxygen need to fill its outer shell? Two. And oxygen makes two bonds, right? All right, so we don't need to draw it every time, do we? No, if you know that oxygen has an atomic number of eight, you know it's got eight electrons, and based on our filling rules, this one fills at two, well, that means we've got six left over. Let's put it in the outer shell. You know it fills at eight. So it needs two more electrons to fill its outer shell, right? We can just draw the numbers rather than draw the atom. So oxygen forms two bonds. So nitrogen. Nitrogen has an atomic number of seven. How many electrons does nitrogen need to fill its outer shell? Just write the numbers down. Nitrogen's got atomic number of seven, so it's got atomic number of seven, so it's got seven protons, so it's got seven electrons. The first two of those electrons will go in the first shell. How many more electrons does it? Five. Three more to fill the outer shell. So nitrogen forms three bonds. Okay? Take chlorine. It can, it, it, any element, virtually, no, it will form three bonds. Hang on. Virtually every element will form chemical bonds with other elements to make compounds, okay? Let's take something like nitrogen. We know nitrogen can form three bonds. One, two, three, okay? We're now diagrams of molecules. We just draw these little sticks to indicate the chemical bonds. Nitrogen we know forms three. So we could add a hydrogen there. Hydrogen we know forms one. So both of these have got the correct number of bonds formed. We could put a hydrogen there. Okay. What about if I put an oxygen there? How many bonds does oxygen form? Oxygen. Two. All right, we could still add it there, but oxygen needs to form another bond with something, right? So what? What? Hydrogen. Maybe hydrogen, yeah. I don't know if that substance exists, to be perfectly honest, but, but it works in terms of the right number of bonds. Okay. Oh, yeah, there is, and the chemists have a convention for that. <laughs> and honestly, I'm not going to spend any time in this class doing that. You'll find that we're dealing with lots of organic molecules, and you nearly always put carbon first. And then you nearly always follow it by hydrogen, and oftentimes by oxygen. And then the rules break down a little bit, because sometimes you can represent the chemical, the different functional groups within the molecule. OK, so what's the atomic number for chlorine? Atomic number for chlorine, 17. How do we deal with chlorine? How does chlorine work in this instance then? Let's look at chlorine. I'll use green because chlorine is a green gas. So we've got to accommodate all 17 electrons. So how many electrons in the first shell? How many electrons in this second shell? How many more electrons have we got to deal with? Ooh, now we're in uncharted territory, right? 
if we fill our second orbital, there's a third orbital. Okay? And that third orbital, let's just say that third orbital fills at 8. Let's just say it fills at 8 as well. So we're okay. All of those seven electrons can go into the third orbital, right? Well, let's just say it's full at eight, okay? Um, let me see if your periodic table in your book shows this. No, it doesn't. All right. Um, once you start to get many, many shells, some of these rules start to break down, and it's not eight. All right, but don't worry about that. For biology, I don't want to get into, I don't want to get that deep into that much chemistry. I don't want to spend the time. How many possible orbitals are there? I mean, because the atomic number of iodine is 53. Yeah, and look at like the atomic number of uranium. Okay. You've got elements with atomic numbers that are, are, are very high. All right. So the electron configuration gets kind of complicated when we start to increase the number of shells. And I don't, just don't want to go there with the chemistry. All right? If you're going to take chemistry classes, they will. They love all this electron orbital and arrangement stuff and energy levels. All right? But for the purposes of biology in this class, this level class in particular, I'm going to leave it at the third orbital, and let's just say it fills eight. There's a fourth orbital, of course. Okay? No. Let's just not worry about the fourth orbital. <laughs> All right, so chlorine, how many electrons does chlorine need to fill its outer shell? So how many bonds does chlorine form? One. All right, you get the pattern, right? So far, quite straightforward. You just have to remember these rules, 288. All right, so let's have a look at this graphic then. I'm not going to talk about these different orbitals the way the electrons sort of zoom around. So let's just draw, I just want to draw your attention to this lower part. All right? Our first shell fills at 2. Our second shell fills at 8. Let's have a look at a substance like neon with an atomic number of 10. Two in the first shell. Neon fills its second shell completely, doesn't it? So how many electrons does neon need to fill its second shell? How many more? None, it's full. How many chemical bonds do you think neon forms? Sorry? How many chemical bonds do you think neon forms? None. How many of you feel a bit uncomfortable by saying none? Here's what probably went on. Some of you probably thought, well, Logically, it makes sense to say none, right? But I feel uncomfortable because everything, example we've looked at, they form bonds. They have to form bonds, right? It's just the way things happen. Well, neon, you were right when you said none. Well, you were mostly right. How about that? When you said none. Neon typically doesn't form chemical bonds. It's one of these elements which the naturally occurring atoms of the element have a full outer shell. Okay. And that makes it very, very, very non-reactive. Neon is, an, is a gas, and it's an example of an element which is, we call this word, inert. Neon is inert. Inert means non-reactive. It doesn't react with anything else. It won't undergo chemical reactions with anything else. Now, I think you can get it to react with things, but it's very difficult. So let's just figure it's inert, doesn't, doesn't form bonds with anything else. It's a loner. Does anybody do welding? Anybody weld? Anybody gas weld, MIG weld? What's the shielding gas you use in MIG welding? Do you remember? Argon is one of the gases you use in welding to shield that electrode. All right? And when you weld, an electric current heats up the metal so hot that it melts. 
And at that kind of temperature, metals want to react with anything, especially oxygen. So you use a shielding gas like argon to stop that molten metal from reacting with the oxygen. And the reason why you use argon is because its outer shell is full and it doesn't react with anything. So if you have a look on your periodic tables, where is neon? Look at the far right, yep, yeah. number 10. And the one below it, AR is argon. You see that whole row, that whole column? Starts with helium, neon, argon, I think it's krypton, xeon, and I don't know, what's that RN? Radon, maybe? They're all inert gases. All right? They're all inert, don't react. Helium is a very non reactive gas. Okay. So I think by now you can probably draw diagrams for all of these elements if I give you their, if I give its atomic number. Right? I think you could. And whether you draw the diagrams or just work out the number of electrons in the outer shell, you can then figure out how many bonds each of these makes. Right? But let's look at lithium, for example. How many electrons does it need to fill its outer shell? Seven. So you might think lithium should make seven bonds, right? No, it doesn't really happen like that. So here's the rule about looking at an atom and figuring out how many bonds it will form by looking at the number of electrons it takes to fill its outer shell. That only really works up to three or four, but usually not five. So let's say it stops at four. Okay? You can look at the number of electrons that an atom needs to fill its outer shell. Okay? up to four, and it will form four bonds. But if it needs five or six or seven to fill its outer shell, then it doesn't usually form five, six, or seven bonds. Okay? So that rule works up to four bonds. So would that mean like you can only form four? No, I'll clarify that in a moment because we're going to talk about the different bonds that elements form and it, and it will become clear. But I just wanted to sort of put that, that rule out there now. That number of electrons it takes to fill the outer shell, if it's up to four, it will form four bonds and let's stop at four. Okay, all right pop past the isotopes. So now we can look at chemical bonding and we're going to look at the different bond types and we're going to look at how the elements form these bonds. Now much of what we're going to do after this when we look at the chemistry of different groups and the properties of water and the properties of many molecules it all comes down to what kind of chemical bonds they form and that, to a large degree, comes down to what elements are in the molecules. So we're going to have a look at the different chemical bonds, all right? So atoms bond to other atoms with chemical bonds. And those chemical bonds are formed by the atoms either sharing or transferring electrons. So the bonds are all about the electrons, and it's about sharing or transferring the electrons. Now, there are other bonds that don't involve transferring or sharing electrons, but I want to look at the transferring and sharing of electrons first because they make the very strong bonds. And it's the chemical bonds between atoms which hold the atoms together and form molecules.
So you've seen this before. Do you remember what this substance was? Azithromycin. Yeah, it's azithromycin. And each of these sticks, remember, represents a bond. As we've already seen, now chemical bonds result from either the transfer or the sharing of electrons. In this case, all of these bonds result from the sharing of electrons. All right? And they've followed our rules so far by looking at the number of electrons it takes to fill the outer shell. Right? Where's a... There. There's a carbon there. One, two, three, four. All right. So let's have a look at these different chemical bond types. I'm going to give you a list, and then we're going to look in more depth at each of these chemical bond types, OK? We've got covalent bonds. That's one kind of bond. Covalent bonds are very strong bonds. And the measure of the strength of a bond is really how much energy it takes to break it. So covalent bonds are very strong bonds. And you might want to put here now that covalent bonds result from the sharing of electrons. You can always think of that as sort of like the, I don't know, the nice way of bonding, right? They share. And then we've got ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are also very strong. You've got to add a but. I'm going to add a but here. Ionic bonds are very strong, but they're not strong in water. When water's around, the ionic bonds are not so strong. And ionic bonds result from the transfer of electrons. Transfer of electrons. So these are the two strong bonds. I'm just going to whip back to this diagram. All of the bonds in this diagram are covalent bonds. All of the bonds in this molecule are covalent bonds. So they're the two strong bonds. And then we've got weak bonds that are extremely important biologically. <coughs> then we've got weak bonds. We've got hydrogen bonds, which are a weak bond. And we've got van der Waal forces, which are also weak bonds. Ionic bonds are the transfer of electrons. Transfer. So weak bonds, hydrogen bonds, van der Waal forces. And both of these bond types, or should I say neither of them, form as a result of sharing or transferring electrons. Neither of these result from transferring or sharing of electrons. Both of these bonds, they're weak, are a result of charge attractions between molecules. Charge attractions. And what kind of charges attract? Opposite charges. So charge attractions between molecules. Yeah, let's just say one molecule was a little bit, had a sort of like negatively charged side to it. And another molecule had a positively charged side to it. Well, that negative side to one molecule and positive side to the other one, they're going to be attracted to each other. And that forms a weak bond. OK? OK. So let's have a look at covalent bonds then. So covalent bond is the sharing of pairs of electrons by atoms. The sharing of pairs of electrons by atoms. And let's, let's draw the hydrogen. There's a nucleus of hydrogen. Oops, I'll do it in black. One proton. 
Electro hydrogen has one electron in its outer shell, right? Well, let's just say we get two hydrogen atoms come close enough together so that their electron clouds, or that first orbital, the electrons overlap a little bit. Let's just say that this electron initially belonged to this nucleus, and this electron initially belonged to this nucleus. If the atoms come together, remember hydrogen, its outer shell is full at 2. Because they're sharing an electron, this one shares this electron from this atom, this atom shares this electron from this atom, so there's one pair of shared electrons, well then this orbital is full, it's got two. And this orbital is full, it's got two. Remember, these electrons are flying around super fast. Okay? And so that sort of stabilizes the atoms and they form a bond. So for every shared pair, there is one bond. Remember, we would draw hydrogen like this, wouldn't we? One bond, one shared pair. If you want an easy way to remember it, think about how the division sign goes, like this, right? Well, just go pop, pop. That's your shared, each of those dots is your shared pair of electrons, right? Now let's look at oxygen then. Look at the diagram up there. And I'm just going to draw the stick diagram for oxygen. This we call a double bond, it's two bonds. Well, let's do our two little dots either side, right? Pop, 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 pop. How many pairs of electrons are shared by these two oxygen atoms? Two pairs are shared, right? So, let's have a look at this diagram. Here we've got one oxygen atom, the other oxygen atom. By sharing their electrons, Let's look at this outer shell of electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This outer shell of this oxygen atom is full at eight. That stabilizes it, makes it good. This one's also full. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? Everybody okay with that? So that's how a covalent bond works. You simply share electrons until your outer shell is full. Now in this example, we've got two hydrogen atoms bonded together and two oxygen atoms bonded together. Let me give you another example. You keep saying that when they, when they bond, it makes them stable. So are they unstable without that outer shell full? Yeah, kind of. Like no, they're not inert. Oxygen actually is very reactive, so is hydrogen, quite reactive. But you can think of it this way. By sharing those electrons, this molecule is a bit more stable than the two atoms existing independently. Okay? So we've looked at this substance, haven't we? CH4. You can draw the stick diagram for it. Why don't you draw the stick diagram for it? the molecular diagram for CH4. If you can't remember it, just work it out from first principles. You know how many bonds carbon and hydrogen each form. Should be able to draw it. Hang on, just draw your stick diagram. Right, there's our carbon. Carbon we know forms four bonds. One, two, three, four. Hydrogen we know forms one bond. Well, we've got four hydrogens. One, two, three, four. Correct. 
in a molecular formula any number, any subscript number indicates the number of atoms of that atom that you have. If I was to write a big number up here, like 2, that would indicate the number of these molecules that I have. Okay. All right, so here's our stick diagram. Now we know that each bond represents a pair of shared electrons, right? Yeah? So let's do our little dot, 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 dot. So here's the outer shell of carbon. count the number of electrons. How many electrons in the outer shell of carbon here? Eight. That electron shell is full. For hydrogen, let's count the number of electrons in its outer shell, in each of their outer shells. And how many we got? One, two. Outer shell of hydrogen is full. So you could, I could give you any stick diagram and you could do this with it, couldn't you? Yeah? What about azithromycin? Oh, come on. It's not that difficult. What about if I said... Oh, what is this substance, by the way? CH4. Methane. No, it's not. Who said methane? You're convinced it's methane, aren't you? It is, in fact, methane. <laughs> All right. But good call. It's methane. All right. My kids now say aluminium and, e and iodine, by the way. Good. Taking back America. <laughs> How dare you throw all that tea in the harbor? <laughs> When I talk about, I won't answer that question right now, when I talk about ionic bonds, it will become clear. But let's just say that there are no metals involved here, right? Okay. So as a general rule, if there's no metals involved, it's going to be covalent bonds all the time. Covalent bonds. Okay? So let's get something a bit more complicated. What about this substance? C, what does that little 2 mean there? two carbon atoms, and I'll go, uh, so, six. Does that work? One, two, three, four, yeah. Draw the stick diagram for that substance, C2H6. Can I encourage you, if, if you've got the hang of this, fine. If you haven't, to go home and practice this, okay? Give yourself practical examples. Yes? Can we do two, two carbons? In this molecule, how many atoms of carbon have we got? And how many atoms of hydrogen have we got? Right, so we need to draw the stick diagram for a molecule that has two carbons, six hydrogens, all bonded together. And you know what the bonding rules are with respect to... Sorry? It does. This is where a little bit of trial and error works. You know how what works really nice is if you've got like molecules, like as like little balls, and you can manipulate them with little sticks to bond them together. Right? Wouldn't it be nice if we did that, if we had those? No? Yeah, we'll be doing it today in lab. <laughs> you were meant to say, yeah, it would be nice. And I'd say, well, great, today's going to be a nice lab then. So let's draw the stick diagram. There's our carbon. Well, I'm going to bond it to the other carbon. And then I'm going to add a 
Okay? That's that molecule. Let's do our oxy our electrons. Is that right just there? No. No? Sure? All right. Well, how many do I need to put there then? What, that? Is that good? So now as homework, I want you to do azithromycin, like this. What are you laughing at? <coughs> what about if I said it was extra credit and you get an instant A in the class? Okay. Ah, isn't it amazing what motivation will do, right? <laughs> motivation is absolute key. Do we have an azithromycin in our book? No. <laughs> what about this one? Think a little bit outside the box for that. And this is the last little practice example I'll give you. C2H4. How does that one work? Have two bonds we'll try it and see. Is there any reason why it couldn't or shouldn't? See how that one works? Carbon does form two bonds with itself. It forms a double bond. Um, it can be up and down, but it, it is angled a little bit like that. Because here we've only got four hydrogens, one, two, three, four. There we had six hydrogens. In order to form this molecule, we would need to put a double bond between the carbons. Sorry? Pop, 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 pop. Remember, each stick's like your division sign, right? Now if we draw our outer orbital, you can count the electrons and it works. Carbon's got all eight it needs, <clears throat> the hydrogens have all two. All right? So to master this, if you've not already got it, again, just go home, do examples. Look in your book, come up with different molecular formulas and do the examples, okay? There is never a spare one. Ever, ever, ever. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right. So I've got a little animation here, as long as Max and PCs are talking to each other today. And it just sort of shows you. See the two hydrogen atoms coming together? They're sort of coming together, they're colliding. See the electron clouds at the bottom overlapping? And at the top there, there's the shared pair of electrons, and then it makes one electron cloud. Okay? I don't know if that helps any. I thought it was a nice animation. So, every atom then has got a characteristic number of covalent bonds that it can form. And we call that the atom's valence. So the atom's valence is the number of covalent bonds it can form. Yeah. Each atom has a characteristic number of covalent bonds it can form. And we call that the atom's valence. 
So the atom's valence is the number of covalent bonds that atom can form. And you can figure it out now, because based on your electron configurations and shell filling rules, you can figure out how many electrons it needs and therefore how many bonds it's going to form. I, I can't remember if I showed this to you already, but what is 96% of living matter made from? What four elements? Right. Or... Either or, it doesn't matter. What's the valence of hydrogen? It's the valence of oxygen. It's the valence of nitrogen. Valence of carbon. I did this one of my other classes, and they said they actually have um, like something at the Smithsonian that talks about this, and there's a, there's a little song about it. But they use Chon, not Honk. Is that kind of a do 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 do? 96% of living matter is made of these four elements, and it's one, two, three, and four. I don't know. Does that strike anybody as being one of those do 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 do? This is the valence of each of those elements. In other words, the number of covalent bonds that each of those elements will form. And you can work it out, right? Valence of hydrogen is 1, because it needs 1 electron to fill its outer shell. Valence of oxygen is 2, because it needs 2 electrons to fill its outer shell. If you find yourself wanting to write this down, it means you didn't write this down. Right? So, again, what I'm trying to do is wean you off of relying on the PowerPoints, writing things in your own words, things that I say, things I write on the board. All right? And I'll do this a bunch of times. I'll say it and draw it, and if you didn't do it, and I put it up in the PowerPoint, so I say, oh, are you writing this down? Then it means you, you're, you're, you need to push yourself harder to wean yourself off of the PowerPoints. Okay? So they're the valence of each of those four elements. But most importantly, you can work it out. So here's a molecule of water, H2O. And it should make sense now why it is H2O. Oxygen is bonded to two hydrogens. There's the stick diagram, and this shows the electron configuration. The only difference here to the ones that we did on the board is on this example, they're showing all of the electron shells of the atoms involved. All right? If you count up those electrons, there are eight in the outer shell of oxygen, and there are two in the outer shell of hydrogen. OK? You good? All right. I'm just curious. See these electrons, the shared pair there and the shared pair there. Do you think they are shared equally between the oxygen and the hydrogen? No. Why? Why does oxygen have more of a pull? What about oxygen could exert more of a pull on that pair of electrons? In, yes. So it's in, in essence a, a, a denser nucleus than hydrogen maybe. There are more protons there. So if there are more protons here, which there are, than here, and you're saying oxygen atom then is going to sort of hog those electrons a little bit, right? It's going to, it's not going to be shared equally between oxygen and hydrogen. not going to be the same distance between the two. You think that those electrons might be closer to the oxygen than the hydrogen. Yeah? yeah? What do you think that will do to this, this side of the molecule then? And what do you think this side of the molecule is? A bit more positive. All right, so good. Why is that? I'll, I just wanted to pop that into your minds, and I'll talk about it more when we talk about hydrogen bonds. So we've looked at this example. That's methane. And I think you're good with methane. Not the stick diagram, but the correct pronunciation, right? Yeah. Okay. OK, so covalent bond polarity. That was what I was just hinting at. There's something called electronegativity. 
an electronegativity is the attraction of one atom for another, another atom's electrons. There's got to be a human equivalent, right? The attraction of, of one spouse for a, another spouse's partner. Right? Another co What's the equivalent in human terms? Oof, that's what it can lead to. Right? So, electronegativity then is the attraction of one atom for the electrons of another atom. Some atoms are very highly electronegative, which means they have a very high attraction for another atom's electrons. Some atoms have a very low in electronegativity, so they've got a very weak attraction for another atom's electrons. An electronegativity has a scale. You can rank atoms based on their electronegativity. You can give atoms sort of a score for their electronegativity. The most electronegative atom is, the winner is, the prize goes to, the most electronegative atom is fluorine. How do we know that? It's research, what the data shows. It's not about what we believe, what we think. Have a look at the periodic table. Where is fluorine? Second column from the right. Yeah, sort of top right. Which is it above? Which element is it just above? Chlorine. Chlorine. All right. What's the atomic number for fluorine? Nine. So how many electrons does fluorine have in its outer shell? Seven. How many electrons does chlorine have in its outer shell? Seven. In your periodic table, do you see that column? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, Iodine, if you look at their atomic numbers and you work out the number of electrons in the outer shell, all of them have seven electrons in the outer shell. In fact, that's one reason why the periodic table is arranged in that way. Those columns, every element in a column has the same number of electrons in its outer shell. Let's have a look at those inert gases. Helium has a full outer shell, full at two. Neon. Eight electrons, it's full. Argon, eight electrons, full. Let's go way over to the other side, see where hydrogen is? How many electrons in its outer shell? One. Go below it, lithium, one electron in its outer shell. Sodium, one electron in its outer shell. So that's part of the reason why the periodic table is arranged that way. All right, let's go back to electronegativities then. Second, we've got oxygen. Oxygen has an electronegativity of three and a half. Oxygen is a very highly electronegative atom. It exerts its pull for the electrons of other atoms. And next is nitrogen at three. What is S again? Sulfur. Sulfur and carbon are about the same at two and a half. What's P? Phosphorus and hydrogen, 2.1. Look at poor old lithium there, rock bottom of the barrel. Electronegativity of 1. So this is that chlorine has 4.0. That means that it has a weak pull? No. A, it's a very highly electronegative atom. Correct. It exerts a very strong pull on the electrons of another atom. Lithium, on the other hand, very, very weak. So, based on these numbers, let's have a little competition, right? Let's just say we've got a carbon and we've got a hydrogen. And there's a covalent bond between them, right? We know that. There's the covalent bond. I'm not going to worry about the other bonds, okay? It's all right. So let's put our carbon, our pair of electrons, given the difference in the electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen, are those electrons going to be equally shared between the two? Are they going to be right in the middle of the two? No. Where are they going to be? 
close to the carbon. All right, maybe they're there, and there's our hydrogen. Okay. So let's take H2O, water. Given the electronegativities of oxygen and hydrogen, where are the pair of electrons on this bond going to be? Close to the oxygen, there and there, and there and there, right? Well, let's take a hydrogen molecule. Where are the electrons going to be here? Dead center. All right. So let's go back to our carbon hydrogen. There's a difference in the electronegativities between carbon and hydrogen. Is it a very big difference, though? It's not, is it? So even though they may be a bit closer to the carbon, they're almost in the middle. Not exactly, but let's just put them a fraction off center. Okay. Given the difference between oxygen and hydrogen, are they just going to be a fraction off center or way over to the oxygen? Way over to the oxygen. All right. So let's draw methane again. They're just off center, right? Given that they're just off center, would you say that this part of the molecule then is a lot more negative than these parts? Slight, maybe very slight, right? So, you know, the electrons are almost equally shared. Not quite, but almost. So maybe this is ever so slightly more negative, and this is maybe ever so slightly more positive. Okay? But not much. But let's have a look at our water molecule. Huge pull. The electrons are spending a lot of time around the oxygen and quite close to it. And their poor old hydrogen doesn't hardly get a look in, right? So this molecule, what would you say about this part of the molecule? Yeah, it's got sort of a, maybe a negative charge to it over there, sort of negative. And this may be a little bit on the positive side, right? Okay. And then we've got this. Oh, I don't even know if it's worth putting a slight positive there and a slight negative there. It might be, but it's probably not worth it hardly, is it? Okay. So, let's think about our covalent bonds. We can have non-polar covalent bonds. Non-polar covalent bonds. So if our electrons are equally shared between the two atoms, or pretty close to equally shared between the two atoms, then we have a non-polar covalent bond. A non-polar covalent bond. And that's because the electron pairs are equally shared, more or less. Okay? You okay with that? So when we've got atoms of the same element bonded together, it's completely nonpolar. Completely nonpolar. They're equally shared, 100%. And when we've got atoms that form bonds that are very similar in their electronegativities, then again we can think about it as a nonpolar covalent bond. They're equally shared, as we've got here. There's maybe a slight disparity, but not much. Okay?
So between atoms of very similar electronegatives, it's a nonpolar covalent bond. Okay? Nonpolar covalent bond. Everybody okay with that? So what do you think we would call a covalent bond where the two atoms that form the covalent bond have very different electronegativities? What would we call that? A polar covalent bond, right. Okay, so polar covalent bond then is a covalent bond where there's unequal sharing of electrons. Unequal sharing of electrons because the atoms have different electronegativities. Unequal sharing of electrons because the atoms have different electronegativities. So is that the covalent bond right there? The bond between oxygen and hydrogen is a covalent bond, but it's a polar covalent bond. What was the word you used? They have different what? Negativities? Electronegativities. All right. So if the electrons are not shared equally by the two atoms, then it's a polar covalent bond. And it's not a case of it being a non-polar or a polar, really. But there's everything in between, right? This is a good example of a polar one. They're quite different in their electronegativities. 3.5 and, and 2.1. Here, the difference in the electronegativity is 2.5, 2.1. That's not much, 0.4. Here, we have a huge difference. All right, 1.4. That's quite a lot. The 1.4, the electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5, and the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. So the difference is 1.4, as opposed to just 0.4 being the difference here. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with the difference in protons. It's just on that electronegativity. Well, yeah. So the question is then, well, why is fluorine so high in its electronegativity? And why is lithium so low? I don't. Again, I don't really want to get into that much chemistry, but if we quickly look at fluorine, you know what, we're out of time. Did I totally dodge that bullet? I don't mind, I can tell you. All right, let's wrap it up there.